up, Church of the Highlands? How you guys doing today? Come on, come on. I love it, I love it, I love it. It is a great day to be in God's house. I sense God's presence here. Worship was so powerful. And of course, we just joined all the men and women of the Alabama Correctional Facilities, all of you who are joining us online, literally from around the world, and all of our church campuses. Come on, one more time. Let's put our hands together and welcome the Highlands family. We love you, we love you. And what a great day to be in church. I mean, God's been moving all day long. And I know this service will be no different. Um, I love our church. I was just thinking about today how, you know, we have 24 local expressions, literally churches and campuses and communities all across Alabama and over into Georgia that are loving people and serving people and reaching people right where they are. But then we get, also get to be a part of the bigger picture together. We join together as one church. It's incredible because God can move in so many different ways through what's happening here at Highlands. One more time, if you love your church, put your hands together and thank God for what he's doing. It's exciting. So... Um, I'm excited for part three of All In. We're gonna jump in God's word in a moment. But when I'm up here, I love just to uh, share with you guys updates about what's happening in an area that I love a lot, and that's Highlands College. And so you you okay if I give you a few updates really quickly? Because there's a lot to celebrate that's happening. And I want you to know you're a part of all of this uh, through your prayers, through your giving, through your resources. God's using you in big ways at HC, whether you know it or not. um, You probably have heard this news, but back in February, we received accreditation, which was a seven-year journey, uh, really just developing our mission, vision, and goals, and making sure that we can measure those in a real way. way. That's exciting, but what that allowed us to do is to uh, submit and now receive permission from the state of Alabama to launch seven, I said seven bachelor's degrees this fall. Yes. And so... Highlands College is now a university and we're able to offer all seven of these this fall. So the freshmen coming in to HC will choose one of these majors. And all these are very strategic areas. Uh, our our uh, really theme verse and mission is around Luke 10 too, that talks about laborers for the harvest field. We wanna prepare leaders to reach people. And these are seven areas we can do that through tech arts, visual arts, family ministry, global ministry, pastoral, student, and worship. And by the way, this is just the beginning. We have a lot of vision for uh, kingdom business degrees and organizational leadership, other areas. We can continue to grow the college, but be praying, especially for the students who are here now and the ones who will be coming into these programs moving forward. And then last but not least, we received, this is just maybe fun for me, our .edu uh, website this week. And so we're now officially highlandscollege.edu, which is a lot of fun. And this is your doorway. If you wanna know any more about Highlands College, what we're doing, what we're a part of. And then also, of course, if you wanna visit or you're a prospective student, you want more information, uh, that is your doorway. Um, But before moving forward, instead of just talking about it, I actually want you guys to meet today one of our Highlands College students. So can y'all put your hands together and welcome Benaya to the stage. Now, I love this guy. He he comes from a great family, has an incredible, incredible parents. His dad, Dan, is our River Chase campus pastor, but I do have to say you have better hair than your dad uh, <laughs> because you have hair, so that's, that's a great thing. But I, I love you, Pastor Dan. You're amazing, and I'm uh, so proud of you. Uh, Benaya is getting ready to graduate uh, next week. He's in our pastoral leadership practicum, getting ready to graduate. And bigger news than that, a week after that, he's getting married, everybody. So got the degree, and you got the spouse who's right here on the front row. Hey, Gracie. What's up? Aren't you proud of him? He's doing great. I know. All right. So, um, so hey, tell us what you've loved about HC. Uh, yeah, just like Pastor Mark was saying, my name is Benaya, uh, fourth semester, and definitely by far one of my favorite parts about Highlands College is really how we don't have to wait to do ministry, but we get to do ministry while we're learning how to operate in a ministry setting um, and really just what it looks like. And uh, you get to impact so many people and you get to apply what you've learned throughout the week and classes and practicum and really get to live that out too. I love that, and you've done that uh, incredibly well. I wanna honor you in front of everybody. So proud of you and how you've pursued not just what's in front of you, but you've gone above and beyond that, uh, which is awesome. Excited to see what God has for you in your future. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, these amazing people in this room, but really through the camera, thousands have invested in Highlands College. What would you, and really the student body of HC, say to them? Yeah, so I actually asked around of our students, just what would you want to say to the church? And it was an overwhelming, just thank you, thank you, thank you for how you support us, how you invest so deeply in our lives. It's truly the the honor of our lives to get to serve alongside of you guys. And the impact you're making in our lives, just with your generosity and with your, um, how you pour your lives out into us, it's not only just impacting individual students, but it's impacting people that we're gonna impact. That when we're placed throughout the country and even throughout the world, you're impacting so many people just because of how kind, how you encourage us and how you serve alongside us. So on behalf of the students, on behalf of the student body, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, that's incredible, incredible, incredible. All right, so 
We're, we're about to jump in God's word. Before you leave, I'm gonna have you do two more things. So we never stopped training at Highlands College. And I was telling Benaya earlier, this is like the TV is like kind of the, you know, the Holy of Holies. Pastor Chris is anointed to change these slides. You've never had the chance to do this. So before you pray for us, and we're, this is really gonna be the, the slide that tells us the title of today's message. This is a big moment. Nothing can happen after this if you mess this up, all right? All right, go ahead, go ahead. Oh my gosh. So... If you've got your Bibles, open up to Revelation 3. We're gonna be talking about the key to living all in is to let him in. Benai, would you pray for us? Yeah, we'd love to. Uh, Lord, thank you for today. God, just thank you for how kind you are to us, for how considerate, how compassionate you are to us. Lord, would you meet us here? God, meet us here. Meet every single heart. Meet every single need. God, I pray, Lord, that your word would grip our hearts, Lord God, that we would fall more in love with you than we were yesterday. And God, that you would speak to each and every single person here, Lord. And Lord, I just pray a blessing over everything that we do today, Lord God. God, we love you. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, come on. Proud of you, proud of you. Awesome, awesome. All right, so it's on record here that my wife, Jill, and I, we have four kids, and um, when you have four of anything, you, you tend to mess up from time to time, and so I'll be the first to admit we have had multiple parent fails. Any parents out there, had he ever had a parent fail? You've ever, okay, I feel better now sharing the story. So uh, we've had lots of them. The one I'm gonna share today is, is honestly one of the worst because it kind of fits into like the worst case scenario file of parenting when you're thinking about you know, what could happen. And so when we uh, had our second born Judah, you know, it's, hey, listen, one child is difficult. All you parents who just had your first, it is very difficult. But when you start adding them, they don't really add, they multiply. The energy, you know, the, the, the having to keep, you know, where are they, what's going on? Or have they been fed, have they slept, all of that. So we're in that season, both young kids. Um, Judah, our second born, is two years old. We're loading up the car one day. We kind of put some stuff in the car. We put him in the car, in the garage. We go back in the house. When we come back out, the door is locked, he's on the inside and so is the key. Judah is locked in the car. And if you've ever been in that situation, it like immediately kind of get this, this, this sick feeling in the pit of your stomach because it's really a helpless feeling. You know what, we can't really do anything. So of course we needed help and instead of calling the police, instead of calling the fire, firemen, we called Pastor Lane, of course. <laughs> why, you may say, why would you have called Pastor Lane? Well, of course, Pastor Lane, is an amazing pastor. If you know him, you can agree with me right there. Uh, you may also know that he is an incredible race car driver. He races up this, this one race a year up Pikes Peak. He's, he's kind of crazy like that. But you may not know this final piece, and that is he is incredible at breaking in cars. Like, could be, a, could be in another life, could be a great car thief, all right? So the, the reason is because uh, he owned a tow truck business or his dad did growing up, and so he's got one of those um, Slim Jims. I never, I know what it is, but in my head, I'm like, that's the food, right? But it's Slim Jim, right? Snap into a Slim Jim, all right? And so he's on the way, he's 30 minutes out, um, but we're stuck now. And we, we are, we are um, you know, looking at Judah, he's looking at us through the glass. And at first we're trying to tell him what to do, you know, coach him like, hey, come over here, push this button right here. And he's just like waving at us like, hey, you know, <laughs> you know just like kids do. And we're trying to make it into a game. We were like, hey, you know, it'll be so much fun. You push this and the prize will, you know, balloons will pop out or whatever. I don't know what we were saying. And he thinks it's a game. So now he's hiding in the car, like, like you know, poking his, his head out. And over the next few minutes, seriously, like the emotion starts building up. You feel so helpless and like we're getting concerned. And so now he's getting concerned. Like we're kind of freaking out. And I'll never, never my, the visual I have is the tears that start welling up in his eyes because we're on one side of the door and he's on another, and all we can do is wait. And I want you to hold on to that emotion, all right? And this is where we're gonna go today, and in this, this message all about letting him in, Revelation 3.20, this is Jesus speaking. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This is the emotion, the emotion of this verse is we have Jesus, and he's, He's standing on one side of the door, door and it implies that of course we, his subject are on the other side of the door. He's on one side, we're on another and he is knocking. And it kind of carries the idea he's been knocking. He didn't just start knocking. Just this continual knock at the door and he's not just knocking, he's speaking. You know, if anyone hears my voice, we know Jesus is, he's, he's Lord, right? And he's savior, but he's also a shepherd. And he, he says he'll leave the 99 to go find the one. In my, my mind and my heart when I, Read that text, I think about him as a shepherd calling us, his sheep, his followers, his children towards him. And if we will just open the door, he's waiting for us to open the door. This is an incredible text. There was a, a, a famous artist 
who, who drew this. In fact, really cool about his story is that he had, he had been an atheist growing up and he gave his heart to Jesus and it was this verse that God really used and it was this verse that led to this painting, one of the most famous paintings um, in, throughout Christian history. This painting is called The Light of the World and I, I love this piece of art. And I'm not a huge art guy all the time, but when I see a piece like this that has such meaning, I just love to dig into it. And this is a beautiful piece of art, so much meaning here, we won't go into all of it, but this, this kind of halo here around Jesus' face represents salvation. Uh, you have this lamp that represents the, the word of God, that he lights our path, which is really good news. But the focus of this uh, picture is this door right here. And there's a lot of interesting things about the door. Uh, first, you'll notice this grass is, is grown very high, which kind of tells us it's been a while since that door has, has been opened. The traffic hasn't, it hasn't been going um, very fluidly. And, and really, the most important part of the door is what's not there. I don't know if you noticed it, but there's no doorknob. In fact, the doorknob isn't on Jesus' side. It's on our side. He's standing at the door and he's knocking. And he wants us to open the door and let him in but the doorknob isn't on his side, it's on ours. And there's so many questions I have about this, this verse and this piece of art, but of course the most obvious one is why is Jesus on the outside? And I think maybe a better way to even ask that question for us here today is this question right here. This will kind of lead us into our text today. Is there anywhere in our lives where Jesus is on the outside? So this verse, the verse Revelation 3.20, is, it's in a... a a letter, it's in Revelation 3, it's the seventh of seven letters to the seven churches of Asia. And in each of these letters, Jesus is speaking. This would be in the red, and if you read it in your Bible, you'll see that these are, these are red letters. And there is so much meaning. In fact, today we're gonna stay right in this text. Um, our entire message will be around this text because there is so much meaning here. And the letter starts in verse 14, which we're about to go to. And as we go through these scriptures today, do y'all, do y'all remember, some of you older folks remember like the, uh, when they used to put prizes in cereal? You know what I'm talking about? Like you'll get a, you get a box of Lucky Charms and like in the bottom, there's some kind of prize. And what would you do immediately? You wouldn't even eat cereal first. You would put your hand, which is kind of gross, right? You put your hand all the way in there until you found that, you know, whatever it might be that you would pull out, right? Or Cracker Jacks, whatever box you might have and you would pull that prize out. So I want us to have that same attitude today. We're gonna go on a biblical adventure today and God has more than just, as we read it more, every level that we dig into this, there is something for us because the key to all in, we gotta get this right, the key to all in, the series we're in, is to what? It's to let him in. And he is standing at that door and he is knocking. So back to the beginning of the letter, verse 14, says to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right, Laodicea, right. And I'm gonna pause right here because I wanna talk about this city. So Laodicea was a very wealthy city in modern, would be modern day Turkey. It's in the Roman Empire back then, but it was in, in modern day Turkey. And they, they, were, they were known throughout the entire empire as kind of a prideful, a little bit of a prideful city. They were, very, they were very self-confident in who they were. And that's because they had a lot of resources. In fact, they had three major industries. They had a banking industry, so they were very, very wealthy. And they, would, um, they had built these banks and they would even um, you know, take money for regionally from other cities, would put their money there to protect it and for investment. They also had a textile industry, which was known for creating the best clothing in all of the Roman Empire. It was like the Gucci of the day, right? And so they created this clothing and they would ship it out all over the Roman Empire. And then interestingly, they had a medical industry, one of the world's first schools of ophthalmology. And they had created all these different medicines um, for the eyes of people to heal different eye eye ailments. And and all of that kind of led to this, actually the city motto of the city was this, this kind of spirit of we have need of nothing. It's very interesting parallels, isn't it, to our world today? I think what is interesting is that was the city of Laodicea, but what, what had happened, what had begun to happen is the spirit of, that was over the city began to come into and influence the church. And this is the tension of this text. Jesus is it's not, he's not speaking to the city, he's speaking to the church. And he's saying we need to be very careful because if we're not careful, the influence of money or wealth will foster a self-sufficiency. And I know we, face, we all face that. It's hard not to in a, an amazing place like America where you can go on Amazon, you can order pretty much whatever you want and you can have it in two days. And sometimes you can have it in one day. And sometimes, or in the future, they're gonna you know, drop it off with drones. I don't know how that's gonna work, but it's just this crazy reality that we kind of, if we're not careful, can begin to think, you know, if we want it, we can take care of it ourselves. And then they also had that textile industry, which was a focus on appearance, which definitely, anytime we focus on the outside, it fosters this idea of of self-centeredness. 
And of course, this, this is absolutely true for our, our generation, our world. You know, the word selfie is only like 12 or 13 years old. I mean, think about even, that, uh, what, if you pick one word to kind of almost define the spirit of the age, right, it would be this word selfie. And it's only about 12 or 13 years old, but it's become, you know, the camera used to be pointed that way and now the camera's pointed at ourselves. And, and they, in fact, they say that there are 93 million selfies taken every day. We look good, we don't look that good. I mean, that is a lot of self-centeredness, right? And it can't help but affect us. Just that's one example of an overall kind of cultural phenomenon is we're just putting the attention on, on ourselves. They say that the average person will take 450 selfies per year. Y'all, we need help. Come on, come on, put your hands on somebody next to you. Let's pray for each other. We need help because that's just too much. That's too much. That millennials will take 25,000 selfies uh, per, per, in their life, which I think that's okay because come on, millennials, we look good. We need some selfies, right? I'm totally joking, all right? So, so this idea of, of self-centeredness, it's, it's a real thing. And then finally, the preeminence of knowledge fostered self-salvation. Basically what, we, what they were saying, and I think if we're not careful, what we can say to God is, hey God, thank you, but we got this. Thank you, but hey, we're good. That we can say, you know, thank you God, but you know what? We know what's best for our body. Thank you God, but we know what's best for our planet. Thank you God, but we know what's best for our future. Hey God, we got this. The problem with that, of course, is we don't got this. <laughs> And this is what Jesus is pleading and really his heart just beats through every word in this letter is you may think you have it, but you don't have it. I read this, this quote a while back. It says, in our generation, we are drowning in knowledge, but we are starved for wisdom. We got so much knowledge, but that, that knowledge cannot save us, everybody. No matter, you know, our rescue plan right now is if it doesn't work out here, we're gonna go to Mars. That's basically what the world's solution is. <laughs> If this world falls apart, we'll just go to another one. That, you cannot replace the gospel of Jesus Christ. No matter how much knowledge we have, it doesn't replace an ounce of wisdom and the wisdom of God that he would want us to have. We are, we are drowning in knowledge, but we are starved for wisdom. Hey, everybody, we may think we got this, but we don't got this. Even that spirit, we got this, makes us overly confident and underqualified. It's kind of like when someone says, hold my beer, right? You're like, you need to stop right now. Right? Hold my, sorry, hold my root beer in church, all right? So you're, what do you, you're overly confident, but you're underqualified. You need to be careful. This is, this is what Jesus is saying to us. There, there is a, a lot going on and maybe you don't even realize it, but it's impacting you. And so he jumps right into the middle of this letter by introducing himself. He you know, writes to this angel of the church of Laodicea. These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And I love the way Jesus pops onto the scene right here. In every letter in Revelation, Jesus always introduces himself, but never stronger than this. He comes right into it and he says, hey, you're getting distracted, but I need you to listen. And he uses that word amen, which basically means, hey, 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 pay attention. I want to help you. I'm not mad at you. I'm just trying to get your attention. You're heading in the wrong direction. You think the world, you think you have need of nothing. You think you got this, but you need me. I am the ruler of all creation and I have something for you. I'm the alpha and omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the author and perfecter. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am your savior. I wanna be your Lord. I am the ruler of all creation and I'm just trying to get your attention because I wanna help you. Here we are 2,000 years later, everybody, and the Jesus, I believe with all of my heart, at every location online, he is trying to get our attention today that there is a spirit of the age that would love to come on us, but we gotta be so careful because God has a better way. He continues on into the next verse, verse 15. This is one you probably heard before. Jesus says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, but because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that verse before, right? Okay, most of us, we grew up in the South. For me and my youth group, it was John 3, 16 and that verse right there. It was like my youth pastor's favorite verse. And you know, for God so loved the world, but if you're cold, he's gonna spit, or lukewarm, he's gonna spit you out of his mouth, right? And the way you normally hear it taught, and it's, 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 it's okay, but it's, there's actually more here. This is like a cereal box moment. You normally hear it taught like God wants you either on fire for him, hot, right? Which what I'm about to say is logical, but I'm not sure it's quite theological or God wants you freezing cold, hating his guts. <laughs> but whatever you do, don't be lukewarm. And of course, lukewarm is absolutely the worst place we can be. But this hot and cold, there's actually more there because in Laodicea, 
They had everything. They were in need of nothing. They had everything they need except for one thing. You probably guessed it. They had no source of water. They were actually missing the source of life itself. So they had to import their water through these aqueducts and they're still there to this day. And they would take them from this one city that had these hot springs and that water was, was hot and it was used in healing. And actually in Colossae, they would take their water on these aqueducts and it was known for being cold and refreshing. But it was so, those cities were so far away, by the time the water got to Laodicea, it would be lukewarm. And if you were a traveler who didn't know that, you would drink it and spit it out of your mouth. Not intentionally, just as a reaction. Like if you've ever had like lukewarm coffee, you just wanna spit it out of your mouth or hot sweets tea, right? You want to spit it out of your mouth. How about a warm protein shake? Anybody ever had a warm protein shake? It's coming out of your mouth. It's not like this, I'm, I'm rejecting you. It's just it's like, it's just your, here, here's what Jesus is saying. You are so far away from me. You've lost your connection to the source of, you think you have everything, but you've removed yourself from me. Because of your distance, you've become lukewarm and you're, you're, you're missing out on all that I have to offer you. And I want to help you the ruler of all creation. I'm, I'm, I'm the great amen. You know, if you've ever been to the beach and, and, and you, have you ever smelled stagnant water at the beach? It's interesting, right? This, this salt water, when it's kind of over in a pool and it's in the sun, it turns into this real sulfur kind of like acidic smell. That's, just, that's, that's what happens when the water, it's still water, but it's now separated from the body, the full of life body that is the ocean. And it gets over here by itself and now it's on its own and it's its own source, and it just doesn't smell very good. This is the picture that Jesus is getting us. You've removed yourself from me, you're too far away, which is why we are a church. We, you've, if you're around Highlands at all, you're gonna hear this over and over, and this is not an announcement. This is not about church programming, but we are a church of next steps because next steps keep us pursuing Christ. That is our goal. To get, we gotta give our heart to Jesus to begin the journey, but then every day of our life is an opportunity for us to pursue Christ so that we stay living and active and connected to the source. A few weeks ago, of course, you know, we, if you've been around, we launched this incredible um, new app that's a great platform. Really, there's so much there for us in, in getting involved. You know, for me, it gives me information every time I open it about what's happening with my kids or student ministry, different areas that are customized. But I love, my favorite part is this top dashboard here which has these icons that really just represent what we're talking about today. They represent the opportunities that we have to continue to pursue Christ. And those first three ones, you know, are about salvation and, and baptism. By the way, everybody, this is incredible. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen over 1,100 people baptized. Come on, put your hands together right there. Incredible. And then, you know, worshiping, and then you have an opportunity to make sure you're connected to groups. And again, that's, it's not like, hey, just get in a group because there's groups. It's get in a group so we can begin to unpack what's going on in our life and get connected to people. And it's honestly the best part of Christianity is being connected to brothers and sisters in Christ. And then we have these icons to represent the growth track and serving and even leading. Bottom line is this, this is a visual representation that we would love all of you to have on your phone of really an internal conviction that has to be, I'm gonna stay connected to Jesus. I wanna be full of refreshing. I wanna be full of healing. I do not wanna be disconnected from the source of life. Amen, everybody? It's right there in the middle that we get in trouble when we get disconnected from him. Verse 17 says this, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do, no, do not realize that you are actually wretched, pitiful. Now check these next three words out. So interesting, they connect directly to the three industries that we've already talked about. You're not rich, you're poor. And you can't heal your eyes, you're actually blind. And you think you got these amazing clothes, you're, act, you're, actually, you're actually naked. What is Jesus doing here? He's not being mean. Jesus is not being mean to us. It's, he loves us and out of his love, he's trying to wake us up to realize we think we have need of nothing. But because we've become lukewarm, we're experiencing these things. And if you're here today, I've been praying so hard for this moment of the service. If you're here today and you've gotten disconnected, you're too far away from your source, this is how you're gonna feel. And I have been there before in my own life. Is even though we may have everything on, you know, possession-wise on the outside, we may have the house, the career, the spouse, you know, the whatever, on the inside, we feel poor. Why? Because we feel like, and really if we're living this way, it is, we feel like it's all on us. This idea of blindness, we, th we may think we know what's best. We have all this knowledge and we know what's best for our life. But when we live that way, it just, it's a frustration. It's like good luck figuring it out. It's, it's described this way by a lot of people I know in my own life. When I'm disconnected from the source, trying to figure out life on my own, it's like I'm in a dark room just reaching around trying to find the light switch. And here's this last one. This is the worst one of all. 
is that when we're living disconnected from Jesus, it's like living naked because we're living with the consequences of our actions, our sins, our mistakes. It's all on us. Again, Jesus isn't being mean. He's just trying to wake us up and say, hey, this is the reality of being disconnected from me, but I have something better. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become actually rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. I love this, but even the first part of that text, if you'll just come close to me, if you'll just come close, you will reconnect to me. I have something for you to buy, which by the way, the price has already been paid for. You come to me and I'm gonna give you three things. We just read them, but I wanna go back through them. We're gonna give you gold refined by fire. Instead of all that pressure that you may feel right now, the key to all in is to let him in. And when we let him in, instead of that pressure, we have peace. And that salve for our eyes, instead of that frustration, which so many people in our generation in the world right now are living in, no, no, we can have vision that God, just like this painting shows, God can light our path like only he can in a supernatural way. We're never making the call for ourselves. We're trusting God and he is leading us and we're following him. And this last one, what, those white clothes, just throughout scripture, the white clothes represent how instead of the shame and the guilt, we can have forgiveness. Come on, somebody, we can have grace and mercy. This is the offer of the great amen. Hey, I'm trying to help you. Yeah, if you're gonna clap, that's a great place to clap. I'm trying to help you. There's a spirit of the age that wants to creep in, but I'm calling you to go all in with me. If you're gonna go all in with me, you gotta be connected. You gotta let me in. Verse 19 and 20, we finish where we started earlier in the message. Those who I love, and again, everything, I've said this, I'm gonna say it again, receive this, every location, every person. Jesus is being strong with us here, but please make sure you know it is out of love because those he loves, he rebukes and he disciplines. We, we can never grow strong in Christ if we're not willing to receive the rebuke and the discipline. We gotta change our relationship with those. Those aren't frustration and anger, that's him loving us. Because he really loves us, he's willing to confront us right where we are. We receive that today. Be earnest and repent. That just means, of course, to turn. Here I am. I stand at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I'm not angry, I'm not frustrated, I'm not irritated. It's taken so long. I'm actually just standing at the door and there's just no doorknob on my side you've got to let me in. And for some of us, it's, it's been way too long. The key to all in is to let him in. And this is a perfect day to let him in. He's standing at the door and he's knocking. I heard one person say that knock, the nails of Calvary. And every nail he took was a knock on the door to my, our hearts. Come on, he's already come to earth. He's already conquered sin. He's already risen from that grave and now he just wants us to receive all that he's done for us, to let him in. There's been so many times in my life where I've kept him out. And it's never, it's, whenever I think I got this, I don't got this. But I love that God is faithful and persistent. I was thinking back, this is a kind of a funny story only on the, on the other end of it, but I was thinking back, this was 2008. Um, I was a youth pastor here at the church and was having so much fun leading our middle school and high school students. Still my first love by far. I just love what God does in those teenage years. And God was moving in some cool ways and we were super busy here at the church. And uh, this time of year is always, about this time of year, it's always busy because of graduations, all of that. Um, and then in the middle of all that, we're getting ready for a mission trip. Uh, we're gonna go to East Africa on a mission trip which was really, really exciting. And by the way, I'm so excited. Mission trips are back. We have students from every campus going on mission trips this year, which is one of the best experiences you can do. Parents, get your child on a mission trip. It is life-changing. So in the middle of all that busyness, I have to get ready for the trip. And part of getting ready was to take some shots to get, you know, for all the different um, vaccines or whatever I needed to go into this, to Tanzania. And so I get all these shots in the middle of being busy. And the, the day or really the week before getting those shots, I was already kind of feeling sick. Wasn't feeling great. Get the shots. And then right after that, I get on a plane and fly to a youth conference with my wife, Jill. And so it was really at that conference, we were in Colorado that I started feeling a little sick. And it was kind of like the, you know, the onset of the flu. And it kind of kept getting worse and worse. Well, the conference ends, we're on the plane back. And it was on the plane, I start feeling my fingers tingling in this a weird kind of way, like almost like I'd lost circulation. 
I didn't think too much about it, thought I was just tired, went home, went to sleep, woke up the next morning, and I had lost pretty much all the feeling and, and all the mobility in my fingers. Which can I just tell you guys, that is a shocking way to wake up. Uh, because I couldn't really move my fingers and I'm like, and I'm t- in my brain, I'm like, move. You know, normally you just move your fingers. I'm like, move, and I'm like, move, and they won't move. And I'm basically screaming at my hands in the bathroom. My wife, Jill, starts waking up from all of that. I go back to her, and this was 2008. Y'all remember before COVID, there was the, the, the swine flu? Y'all remember the swine flu, that old school stuff? It was around that time, and, and she was like half awake. I'm like, I can't move my hand. She's like, oh, you got the swine flu. It found you, right? Like, I'm like, no, I don't think this is what that is. So anyway, we get, we get in the, the car, we go down to Christ Health Center. Um, Dr. Record uh, sees me and I'm, I'm kind of like, I got this. He's gonna tell me exactly what's going on. And he's just, he, immediately he's gonna solve this problem and I'm gonna go home you know, with some kind of prescription. He looks at me like, uh-uh, this isn't good. I'm like, what, what do you mean not good? He's like, not good. Like we're going to the emergency room, neurologist, like we're getting you in right now, not good. But I'm still kind of like, I got this, we're gonna be all right. Well, I get there and they start a sequence of tests. Obviously, trying to figure out, and honestly, a lot of times with stuff like this, they're not trying to figure out what it is or they are by checking out what it's not. And so the first test I receive is just like a typical blood test and that doesn't show any results or, or for sure what's going on. And so the, the next one was um, uh, really when I entered the torture chamber, it was, it was a room uh, with a, with, and I, by the point I'm in a gown, right? And, and which is fine up front, but in the back, you know, that thing, that sucker's open. And they're like, hey, lay down on your stomach on this table, which is already terrible enough. And so it's just, it's just why, it's just why I'm just gonna tell you, I was just there. And, and they're like, we're gonna do a spinal tap, which basically is, you know, them taking a sword and jabbing it in your spine and sucking out spinal fluid, um, which is great. Praise God for it. But anyway, so I'm laying there and the first nurse is kind of coaching me through that. The second nurse comes in with the, with the, the, the needle and she's first thing out of her mouth. Oh my goodness, Pastor Mark. And I'm just like, there's no, there's no dignity left. It's just like, it's over. What do you want to talk about? Church last Sunday? Let's just sit here and talk about it, you know? And they, they do this final tap and, and they're waiting for results of that. And they're like, next up, we're going to take you to this other room and we're going to check, uh, I think it's called a nerve conduction test. We're going to hook these electrodes. And they, they try to make it seem so like no big deal. We're going to hook these electrodes up and, you know, we'll put them in lo- really sensitive places that no one else, no one ever likes being, you know, even touched on, but we're going to shock you right there, like in between your fingers and then put one on your, in between your toes. And we're going to turn on this small electrical device, which looked like an electric chair. And we're gonna turn it on and it's gonna, we're gonna test how fast this goes through your body. And that was the first time Jill was allowed to walk in. She walked right back out. I was screaming like a baby in that moment. And so we're in the middle of all this. And at the end of all those tests, the, the next test was an MRI, which is basically a coffin. If y'all been in one, you know what I'm talking about. I don't like small spaces, super loud. And they're like, you're gonna be in there for about 45 minutes. And y'all, I lay down and the whole time I'm like, I got this, I got this, I got this. Now I'm laying there by myself. And I am, just to be very honest with you, I am terrified. There is so much fear. Because they're using big words. Like words that just terrify you. Diagnosis, possible diagnosis just terrify you. What made it worse is on the top of that MRI machine was a, was a yellow smiley face sticker. <laughs> That sucker was looking right at me, smiling. I'm like, you need to stop smiling at me. And they're like, don't move. I'm like, I can't move. Literally, I'm here because I can't move, all right? So I'm in there for like 45 minutes. I just sense in that moment an opportunity. So much fear in that moment of decision. At all of our locations today, I don't know where you are. The question we asked earlier is the right question. I don't know if there's any area of your life where Jesus is on the outside, but I know if there is, This is a beautiful moment to let him in. This is a beautiful moment to let him in, maybe for the first time, to that room called anxiety. This is a beautiful moment to let him in to that room called family, to let him into that room called sexuality, to let him into the room called money, to your past, to your future. Let him into the room called your dreams. I I don't know what your room is. Maybe it's the room of anger that he's been on the outside or the room of depression he's been on the outside or the the womb of trauma or fear that he's been on the outside or or maybe it's just he's never been on the inside at all. What he wants to do is he wants to come in and the last part of that text, he wants to come in and he wants to eat with us. He wants relationship. There's no more intimate picture in the Bible in those days than someone coming in to have a meal. That's exactly what God wants to do. If we will let him in He wants to step into that area and bring with him all of his strength, all of his power. In fact, this is the last two 
verses of Revelation 3, four, uh, verses 21 and 22, to the one who opens that door, you will not only experience relationship, but you'll experience victory. Come on, somebody. This relationship's powerful, but what he's saying is when I step into that room, I bring with me victory. And I'll give you the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down on the throne of my father. Two thrones. One is victory here on earth, victory over sin, victory over our guilt, victory over our shame. And I love that second throne. It's the throne where he sits down by the father and that's the victory of eternal life with God past this world. I will give you access to me and I will give you this victory. But here's the deal. You gotta let me in. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. And God is here. 2,000 years later, we're here. And God is here. And he's asking us today, do you hear me? If you do, will you let me in? Would you pray? Bow your heads. We're gonna pray together today. I deeply sense God's presence here. You know, I was thinking back to that moment for me, and maybe this relates to where you are right now. I'm laying in that MRI machine. There wasn't a diagnosis yet, which thank God they did diagnose it. And here years later, I'm completely healed. But before any of that, I had the decision that we all have right now. Is before I saw the results, before I saw the end of the story, was to let him in to that moment. I'm gonna pray two prayers and we're gonna stay together at all campuses. The first one is a prayer for anyone who needs to let him into your life for the first time. Or you've, you've, you've known him in the past, but you've been so far away from God. This is letting him into your life, turning that door handle and letting the, the God of the universe, Jesus himself, step into your heart. And then a second prayer that's all about letting him into the specific areas of our life. But that first one, it is the most important. You're here today, and you don't have that relationship with Jesus and you know it. I'm not gonna embarrass you or have you come down front or even stand, or, ha- or have you stand or even today raise your hands, but you're there in your seats, you're joining us online and you want to invite him into your life. If it's you, you know it. And if it's you, pray these words in your heart or even out loud. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life and ask you to forgive me of my sins, all of my mistakes. I turn away from all of that and I am running to you. Today, I let you in. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and God, fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live for you for the rest of my life. God, I pray for those who just made that incredible confession of faith. God, even now, they're experiencing your peace and your joy and your love. God, thank you for them. I bless them right now in the name of Jesus. As they leave here, the old is gone and the new has come. Now, for anyone here, probably most, if not all of us here, there's some area of our life where right now we're trying to do it ourselves. We're self-sufficient. We're trying to save ourselves in that area. We've just put the attention on ourselves and we're, we're worn out. We know in that area we've become lukewarm. We're disconnected. We're too far from you. God, today we're stepping in. We're letting you step in. We're opening the door and letting you step in. I don't know what that area is for you, but get in your heart. Open your hands right where you are. God, I pray for all of us that as you're knocking, we will be faithful and faith-filled to let you in. God, thank you that your word tells us when you come in, you're gonna come in with a relationship with intimacy and closeness, and you're gonna do what only you can. God, we ask you to forgive us in those areas, to set us free. And God, that's exactly what you promised, that you'll come in with your grace and with your mercy, and with your power and your strength. And right now, God, we're sensing that in this area. We let go of it and we trust you with it. We invite you into that hurt, into that pain, into that anxiety, into that fear right now in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you in advance before we see anything maybe in the physical change, we claim victory in the name of Jesus. Jesus. God, you made a way for victory so that we could experience that. And so we thank you through the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised you out of that grave lives inside of us. And now, God, you're stepping into those areas. And God, you're doing what only you can do. And we receive it today. God, thank you that we are allowed to be followers of Jesus. We thank you, God, that you've given us a relationship with you. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen. 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 Come on, put your hands together and celebrate, especially those who gave their heart to Jesus.